Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show for your Monday edition. Tis the 9th of January, and today's show will be driven actually by some viewer comments that were posted on the YouTube channel. I'll get to those in just a second. We'll talk about covered calls. We'll talk about some of these covered call buy right strategy ETFs that are out there, and you know, maybe one of those should be uh, maybe a solution for you. So I will, uh, I'll start there, and then at the end of this, we'll go into what happened out there in our markets, as I mentioned. The real excitement, I guess, kind of starts tomorrow with Jerome Powell giving a presentation in Sweden, which will happen at 6 a.m. Pacific time. And then later on in the week, we're going to have CPI data. And, of course, the mother load on Friday with the major bank earnings, which will be very exciting. And I was looking at this market. We opened up Sunday night thinking, ooh, this is going to be pretty good. We were up about half a percentage point on Sunday night when these markets open, the futures markets open. I thought, going to be a good damn Monday. And it started off looking great. Really started moving up and then rolled over and most of these major market indexes doing okay except for the Dow. Uh, we'll look at that at the end of today's show. So welcome everybody. Let me dive right into our topic du jour. Selling covered calls. Should you buy an ETF or should you do this yourself? And, and the question came through, I think this is the question right, no, no, I, of course I'm all out of sync. Um, it's really this question from Steve and a couple of others. Steve says, you mentioned getting into SPY to mitigate risk over buying a single stock. A friend of mine introduced me to JPI, which holds the S&P 500 stocks and sells covered calls against uh, the holdings, giving a monthly premium of close to 12% per year. What's your thoughts on JPI? Uh, first off, it does not hold the S&P 500 stocks. Just to make sure you understand what they do is, first off, when I was talking, I think I was answering Tomasina's question last week about a friend of hers who had a single company, and I don't remember the name of the company, but let's say it was Microsoft. You know, and keeping all of your 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 stock in one position uh, opens up huge risk to you. It wasn't it wasn't Microsoft. It was um, TJ Maxx. TJ Maxx is who had all those shares in. So what JPI JP, JEPI is attempting to do is say, okay, we're going to look at that S and P five hundred, and we'll pick we'll cherry pick out of there things that meet ESG requirements, right? So that's there's a filtration process there for a lot of these funds. ESG is a big buzzword. Honestly, I think it's a bunch of BS. Uh, for those that don't know, ESG is environment, social, um, environment, social, and governance. It's basically are they good companies? Are they dealing guns? You know, are they running pipelines through Indian reservations? You know, that's bad for the environment. Okay. Um, oh, was Microsoft? Okay. For some reason, I thought it was TJ Maxx, but. Um, Anyway, um, they go through an ESG process. And what's interesting is you start with the S&P 500, which is right around 503, I think it's 503 companies right now. When they go through the ESG, they're also weeding out you know, companies that don't meet those criteria. Then they'll look at uh, volatility. So they're going for kind of low volatility companies, which right away means you're probably not going to have too much exposure to things like Apple, Amazon, and the FANG stocks. No, not, not too much big tech exposure. So right away you're, you're wheedle out a lot there so from my research jpi has about 95 different holdings so it's definitely not the s p 500 it's about one fifth of the s p 500 so you're not as diversified so what i was talking about with my one percent strategy and kind of what my suggestion was to um i think tomasina's friend who had the tj maxx was First off, diversify your TJ Maxx holdings way too much in one company. You're getting a 1.5% yield on TJ Maxx, but you can also get a 1.5% yield on the S&P 500. One of those is significantly less volatile, that being the S&P 500. So mitigate your risk by going to the S&P 500. We start there. Then I got this email, this message from Steve, which is a good one. Why not go in Jeppy? Right, because if I go SPY and I don't do anything with it, I'll get 1.5% rate of return from the dividends per year. But if I buy Jeppy, which apparently is using components of the S&P 500 and then using option strategies on that, we'll get to that more in a second, uh, they're getting a yield close to 12%. You're like, well, wait a minute. That sounds like my 1% strategy, doesn't it? And that's essentially what they're doing. Now, the question, I guess, is would you rather do a, a, an options covered call strategy yourself or do an ETF? I guess depends on how that ETF is being run and what your knowledge of is with options. So for those who may not know, um, there's a common strategy out there called a buy right strategy. So let's say you think that, well, let's just pick any stocks. You guys don't have to stare at my mug any longer. Let's just go out here and we'll go to, uh, how about, oh, we, we looked at Microsoft. M F, no, it's too much tech. Let's go to a Goldman Sachs, right? We go to a nice financial firm. So here you got Goldman Sachs. 
And if you look at this price chart going back into June of last year, it's been on an uptrend, albeit a very volatile, wild uptrend. So what you could do is if you felt it was on an uptrend, you put a, a line where you want to be a buyer at and you can say, okay, maybe I, I buy it immediately right now at 353. And then when I do that, I could sell a covered call against it. And a covered call basically says, let, let's assume we bought it today, right? So there you go. You bought it at 353.19. So now you're long Goldman Sachs. A buy right strategy says you're going to buy the underlier, in this case, Goldman Sachs, and then you're going to write a covered call against that. So let's say I decide to sell my covered call uh, at 374. That's you know $21 higher than current price. Okay, fine. If it gets up there, then my shares are simply taken away from me, but I also collect a good amount of premium for selling that covered call. That's a buy right strategy, and that's what I do manually. I personally prefer to do it manual. I like to get in there and make my options trades. And I don't know, it's part of the excitement. Call me a glutton for punishment. I also know that the fees that I'm charging myself are a lot less than what these firms are, might be charging you. So that is a covered call buy right strategy. That's kind of what I'm doing on my 1% portfolio that I've mentioned many times on this program in the past. The, the flexibility I have is I am in total control of my investment decisions and I'm doing it on the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100 or some other ETF that's fairly liquid. So in this example here, um, you know, this Goldman Sachs, I my only real major, major risk is that this thing just absolutely collapses and just falls apart. Well, that's why we go into something that's diversified like SPY, right? So we'll use SPY again. And I could do the exact same process. I might look at this and say, hey, I'm thinking about buying SPY. I'll buy it uh, at the closing price today, which is called um, 388. And I could sell a call against that expecting that, yeah, it might get up to 408, but maybe not in the next 30 days. So I'll sell a 30 day call option against that covered call and collect that premium. And that could get me, you know, 1% a month, 2% a month, depends on the volatility at that moment in time. So that's a buy right strategy. And it, for anybody who's holding positions in any portfolio, I, I really think you should consider selling covered calls against your positions just to generate an extra amount of income. And you could put it very high price compared to current, and you know, your odds are very low that you're gonna get exercise and your shares will be taken away. But at least even if you got an extra quarter of a percent per month, it's gonna add up to you know, quite a bit of money by the end of the year, especially if you're compounding. So that's doing it manually. Doing it uh, through an ETF, there, there's several different ones out there. Jeppy is probably one of the bigger ones. So what Jeppy is, it's called the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income Fund. And there's some misconceptions out there that I wanna make sure I, I clarify with everybody. What Jeppy attempts to do, again, is take components of the S&P 500, which are ESG, that's right, remove those evil stock, right, Randy? How do you screen for the evil companies? Well, a lot of people are gonna look at companies like um, Philip Morris, Altria, right? Go, oh, those are cigarette companies, that's garbage. You're gonna look at uh, Morelids or Constellation Brands that sell alcohol and beer and say, that's evil company, right? So. I think it's all relatively subjective, but those are some of the basic filters for it. Um, personally, I think it's I think it's kind of stupid to do ESG, but whatever. Um, to each their own, doesn't make a difference. Bottom line is it's not the S&P 500 that Jeppy is tracking, it's components of the S&P 500, and it's about 95 components. So what Jeppy does is they basically collect money, 80% of it is gonna be bought into, I believe 80% goes into the underliers, to collect the uh, dividends. And then what they do is they take the other 20% and they don't sell covered calls. This is a misconception that I think people have. They actually buy something that's called um, an ELN. It stands for an equity linked note. And this is just a very complicated, obscure financial product that utilizes options, but they're actually buying an uh, equity linked note. And in that note, they're allowed to do options. So it's kind of, they're not doing options really directly, it's through these um, exchange, uh, sorry, equity linked notes. So basically it's just a covered call strategy. And the, the good news is the fees aren't that high on these. I think it's, uh, if I remember correctly, Jeppy is about a 0.35% annual fee. So that's relatively low. I mean, remember we looked at SPY was 0 0.09. So obviously SPY is gonna be one of the cheapest. Um, are there competitors out there? Sure. Uh, you know, there was a comment that was made actually on this one from Steve. There is another version of this, which is um, JEPQ, right? So JEPQ. And this is the exact same strategy. It's just using NASDAQ specific. You know, it's going to be looking for the quality ones that aren't as volatile, don't have as much, um, you know, wild swings and selling options or basically, 
you know, collecting the premium on those stocks as well as these equity linked notes to generate premium. Now, I'm not going to go too much into equity linked notes. I think it's one of those ones that will make people's heads spin. Um, but are they a good investment? Let me ask you this. Um, I'll let you guys answer this one. If you believe that we're headed for the next bull market, doesn't matter whether they are or not, just let's just assume that we all think, man, we've bottomed out and now we're going to have the next big bull market phase. This again, is part of what we have to do as traders is say, what market phase am I going into? Because this type of strategy may have some issues. So let me ask you this. Do you think that buying a covered call ETF will beat or underperform the market in a bull market? I'll let you guys type that in the chat as I read through some of these questions. How do you see the overall market situation in your markets? I look at the S&P 500. That to me is the overall market situation. Uh, how do you screen people companies? I personally don't, Randy. Um, definitely don't. Uh, let's see what else I have here. Can you sell calls against long calls? Uh, <laughs> Lori says it. You can sell calls against long calls uh, and can sell puts against long puts too. Yeah, there's some other ones. I don't know much about QYLD. There you go. So I got underperforming a bull market. Um, Lisa said underperform. Jimmy says beat. Boss Pooper says beat. No, it will underperform. And here's why. Let's say, for example, let, let's draw out the visual here and we'll go back to uh, SPY, right? Just, just use that as the benchmark. It's going to underperform and it, it can underperform significantly. If you understand how covered calls work and kind of why that strategy worked so well this year for me personally, it's because we were in a down market, right? So as that market's selling off, you're collecting premium. So what you're really doing is you're lowering your cost that you paid. So if the stock, let's say you collected 5% premium on your, on your, um, on puts that you sold, right? You sold some puts, you collected 5% premium. If that security drops 10%, well, you're only technically down 5% now because you already collected 5% worth of premium. So it's offsetting some of those losses. However, in a bull market, let's say we bought SPY, Hey, okay, so we bought SPY today. There we are at uh, 388, right? I'm gonna move this over here. And we're looking at this. It feels like things may have consolidated a little bit. And now we're expecting maybe the next bull market rally. So we decide to sell these 408s. And let's say those 408s, uh, let me go to my annotation tools here. We, let's say we sold the covered calls and we collected, collected 1%. And that's for the March contract. I don't want to do it for February, or sorry, I don't want to do it for January. It's too close, so we'll do actually the, the February contract. So let's go out here to February third week. It's going to be February 17th. So we have until right now this current bar and where this blue line is for price to stay underneath that dashed blue line at the top, the horizontal line, right? But what happens if all of a sudden the markets just go absolutely gangbusters, some news comes out, Jerome Powell says, we're going to do a pivot and we're going to cut rates by a full 100 basis points. Your market's going to go like this. They go off the charts. So what happens is, even though I, I collected 1% premium, well, the market has jumped. We'll get the exact percentage here. The market will have jumped 5.4% is where I max out at. Everything above that, I lose. So how much did I actually end up losing? Well, I would have missed out on market performance of at least 11%. So it's going to greatly underperform the market in a very bullish market situation, right? Of course, you don't see things usually go that parabolic. So it's, I'm being a little bit dramatic here. But just assume that, you know, over time, if we have a nice bullish market, those shares will be taken away. So let's say I sell, uh, I buy some SPY today and I sell some covered calls against it right now, 1% higher than the market or 2% higher. And I collect that premium. If that market really moves, anything above those levels disappears. I mean, I have a situation right now on XLE, which is exactly that. Let's, I'll show you my XLE. So I uh, sold, I was selling puts on XL, is it XLE? Uh, no, XLF. Yep. So I was selling some puts on XLF and I sold puts, I got exercised. And then as I got exercised, um, I forget what my number was. I want to say 35. So I had sold the 35 puts on XLF. I got exercised and I immediately sold the 35 calls, which is the exact same price I entered at. So in essence, if it gets above 35, I already collected the premium for selling the put 
and I collected the premium for selling the call against my current long position. So I'm actually gonna be making money and the, the stock is barely above $35. So anything right now in this current situation, my options expire January 20th. I will put a big vertical line here for you just so you understand the, the risks that I have. And, and I'm currently in this situation where I will lose money uh, or leave money on the table, I should say. So right here, let's put a line at 35 bucks. I'm gonna put this up here at 35. So I own, I'm long XLF. I own XLF and anything above $35, I don't collect. I don't own that anymore because I sold the call options. So at 35 bucks, it'll be taken away from me. It could be taken away tomorrow, but most likely it will happen on January 20th. And I'm just gonna leave it because for me, in part of my 1% portfolio strategy, I'm okay with that. Uh, obviously I would love to be long and be gaining more, but I already sold the options against it. The, my position to let that disappear from my portfolio. So this is you know, one of the risks of covered calls is your position could be taken away from you. And if I was really bullish on financials, I could have maybe sold the 36s and gone a little bit higher, but the premium would not have been as much. And that would have been a little bit of a, uh, I guess a drawdown in this situation. So I've kind of gone all over the place. If there are questions in there, type them in a chat so I can answer those. I have some uh, QYLD, nice dividends, right? So a QYLD. Okay, yeah, and again, there, there are a ton of these covered call strategies. So this is a covered call ETF. I don't know the mechanics of this one, so I can't speak to um, these ELNs. It, it, you know, every so often as a trader, having done this for so long, there's some new thing that pops up, right? I remember when you had C, uh, collateralized default swaps and then you had certificates for difference and there are all these different products pop up every now and again. And you gotta be careful with what they are, how they, rep how they represent the underlier and, and how they work. Um, ELNs are a unique one, which I think are, are still relatively new. They seem very complicated. And I, I personally don't really trust them, um, but that's how JEPI, J-E-P-I and J-E-P-Q work is they're using uh, ex equity linked notes, ELNs. Global X NASDAQ, they may actually be doing a covered call strategy without an ELN. And I think that there's probably gonna be a greater uh, rate of return in those types of markets out there. Couldn't the fund roll the options up and further out if it was being tested? It could, Tom. Unfortunately, I don't know the, the actual strategies that they're implementing, right? Uh, if it's an ETF, you know, there's going to be a prospectus out there that gives more detail into it. But in looking at JEPI and JP Morgan's site, it does a, a good job of not really telling you what it does, right? I feel like maybe that's their competitive advantage, right? They don't want to tell the competition exactly how this thing works. So um, they, could, they could certainly roll them, but I don't know what exactly they're doing on it. The good news is, you know, they beat the market last year. You're gonna beat the market. In a market that's choppy, it's actually, I mentioned this before, with equities, with futures, with Forex, if it goes up and you're long, you make money. If you're long and it goes down, you lose money. If it goes sideways, you you don't make anything. With options, again, if you're, uh, let's say you you bought some, well, I guess it depends on the strategy, but you, know, you could make money if it goes sideways or up or down depending, and you have a 66% chance versus a 33% chance in other asset classes. So in a sideways market, a call right strategy or a buy right strategy, great. In a sideways market, you'll, you'll beat the market because it's gonna be collecting that premium even though things are going sideways and doing nothing. In a slightly down market, it's gonna beat the market as well. In a slightly up market, it will probably beat or equal the market, but in an aggressive up market, it's gonna underperform. And that's pretty much it. Jeppy holds REITs also, so it's taxed as regular income. Uh, it may have some tax treatment. I don't know about the tax treatment of it, but I didn't see any REITs in there. Real quickly, uh, one of my favorites just to analyze what these companies are holding is just go to bar chart and you can find the constituents of something. Here's JEPI. So I'll type in JEPI, JP Morgan Equity Premium Income Fund. And then we'll scroll down here and we'll look at the constituents. I didn't remember seeing any REITs in there, but that would be interesting because you would get some, some tax treatment there. So notice, um, you know, most of the holdings. And one other thing that's noteworthy here, you guys remember when we pulled up the holdings of the S&P 500, you had Microsoft and Apple were bohemoths and absolutely overweighted that portfolio, which to me puts the S&P in a riskier position. Notice this one, the, the heaviest thing in this portfolio is ABV, which has a 1.67% 1, 1. of the portfolio. And most of these are in the 1% mark. So that's really good. Um, there was a good YouTube regarding Yepi versus SCAC. Okay. 
Um, but you scroll down here and you can see here, these are some of the options that they're doing on it. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing there, but you can see the SPX. So they're actually going against the overall index. My assumption would be that they would be doing them on individual securities, but they're doing it on the SPX, it would appear. Um, so not exactly sure what these different positions are, but the, my assumption would be that those are the options positions. So there you go. Um, it actually does have some Amazon. Oh no, I'm sorry. Amazon's on the list, but it's almost no waiting in there. Look at all these that have 0% of holdings. There are really none of them there. So it says it has 124 components, but really, there's, um, it looks to me like there's actually about 80 that actually have positions in the portfolio. So I guess the, the, story, the answer to the question um, is a matter of personal preference. Selling covered calls, should you buy an ETF? I know some of you have mentioned several different types of ETFs there. You know, could you just buy those ETFs and not have to deal with it? Or could you just do it yourself? And again, this is a matter of personal preference. I personally would much rather do it myself. I love it. It's, it's kind of like saying, would you rather have a designated hitter for you in baseball? No, I want to go out there and I want to swing the bat. I want to play the game. So there's no question for me, I'm going to do it myself category. If you are in the, hey, I just want to buy an ETF and, and collect those dividends and, and higher yield, remember, remember a couple things. Number one is... Look at the broader picture of the market and try to discern where we are in the big picture. If it looks like we've been sold off for a long period of time and are slowly maybe transitioning to another bullish market, I'd be careful with that one because you may underperform the market. You're better just to go long the market, right? Just, just buy the ETFs or buy some uh, call options and get a higher rate of return that way. Uh, do it yourself so you know exactly. I'm totally with you, Liz. Yeah, I'd much rather know exactly what's being done. But some people just want to buy an ETF and earn a rate of return. So just know it's not... When you stack these up next to each other and you say, oh, well, the S&P 500 only gives me 1.5%, but this thing's going to give me 12%, it sounds like a no-brainer. But remember, if we have a really big bull market, the value of the S&P 500 as the underlier will go up more and you will lose that profit on JEPI. So, you know, you could have a 30% up year in the SPY, and all of a sudden you're like, well, I only made like 12 or 13% in, in JEPI. Uh, Unfortunately, you'll lose some of that there. Now, if you're going to pick some of these other ones, I, I see you guys using SCHD. There's several others out there, QYLD. Another uh, popular one is Devo. Let me bring that one up here. Here's DIVO. All right, this is another... Amplify, CWP Enhanced Dividends Income ETF. It sounds so fancy with those long names out there. Uh, I would definitely dig into what they are, how they function. For example, Devo is one I've looked at for a while. They only have 23 or 24 holdings, but their management fee is 0.55%. Jeppy holds about 95 positions and has a 0.35% management fee. So uh, on surface value, I would say JEPI looks better but do your research, look at them, see what they're holding, see how they function. Um, and, you know, don't just look at, oh, it's giving me 12%. I got to load the boat on that bad boy. So hope that helped. Uh, let's see. My fear is, oh, uh, we got, we're back on Tesla. All right, let me get to the Tesla one in a second. I have dividend stocks and CES in the stable part of my portfolio. Good. <sighs> All right. Yeah, if there's, I, unfortunately, I don't have, if you want to email me that link, uh, I can post it in chat um, or Dave. Let's see, Dave, if you have the chat, let me see if I, mm, 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 mm. I'm trying to see if I can, uh, if you find it, let me know. I don't think you can post it in chat, but uh, I might be able to give you permission to post it in the chat here, but let me know. Uh, let's see, not sure if my strategy to sell calls to get rid of shares versus selling the shares directly is the right approach. Well, it's all about collecting premium, right? It's just that extra little bit. And, and with all the with the puts that I sell, I'm going far enough out of the money where, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to get exercise, but I'm looking to make, you know, one to 3% per month. One is the minimum, three, I don't want to go higher than three because I feel like I'm taking too much risk. Um, that said, if I do get exercise on something like, like Tesla, um, I actually did get exercise on Tesla, I was sold out of that one. Um, you know, when it's in a free fall situation like this, yeah, this, this could have burned you. I would rather sell things that are so far out of the money and collect a higher premium, and then once things start to rally up, um, I might revise my approach, right? If I'm, if I'm in a very bullish market, Ganesh, I don't know how close to current price I'm going to sell my covered calls. But in, look at the situation like this one. Forget that it's Tesla because I'm actually bullish on Tesla. But if I was exercised on Tesla right now, I'd be okay selling my covered calls very close to price because we're in a downtrend. So I have the 120 puts. I also, uh, I, sorry, I sold the 120 puts. 
So anything below 120 by January 20th, I'm going to own, uh, in this case, I had 300, uh, 300 shares of Tesla. So I'll own 300 shares of Tesla. I also have the 100s. So if we get down below you know, 100, I'm going to have even more Tesla in my account. If I get exercise on Tesla, uh, I will immediately, well, depending where we are price-wise, I'll sell covered calls probably right at current price. And the reason for that is it's in a downtrend and it looks painful. So I'm okay with that. But if this was flipped upside down, let me see something here. Ooh, I don't use all the tools in this one, but real quickly, see if I can find, let's go to the hot list here and see if I can find something that's been on a really strong uptrend. No, no, no. Unless you guys have one off the top of your head, my brain is kind of not uh, pulling off. Uh, there you go. Let's just say we had Viridian Therapeutics, right? And let's say I had purchased this and would I sell a covered call like at 34? Probably not because it looks like it's going to just keep on rallying. So I may actually just move my stop loss up. This thing looks really strong. So you're right, Ganesh. It's, it's not a question of arbitrarily saying, oh, I'm going to no matter what sell my, my covered calls. I need to analyze the market situation. And if I find myself long, like Tesla shares, right? I am at risk right now of having several hundred shares of Tesla put to my account on January 20th. If I get it and Tesla starts to round the corner and starts to starts an uptrend here and starts ripping, I'm not going to sell covered calls. I'm just going to move my stop loss up on that position and get a bigger gain until, you know, maybe we maybe I hit some supply up here at one, you know, 200. Great. Well, maybe then I'll sell covered calls at that price thinking it's going to stall there anyway, right? This is where I think the important part of understanding supply and demand methodology becomes so critical because you're looking for overhead supply, demand down below, and using those as points where you'd want to sell your calls or your puts to collect that premium using those buyers or sellers, those supply and demand zones to further, um, I guess, reinforce your decision in that process. Hopefully that helped. Uh, my fear is Tesla goes greater than 130 in the next few days, but falls below 130. How to play here? So it's ultimately like selling Tesla at 130. Well, you know, the, the problem, let me see if I can find this video that Dave's putting in here and I'll post it in the chat. I hate putting in videos of people I don't know. So I'm trusting you on this one, Dave. <laughs> uh, let's go YouTube one second real quick. And... I'll have to check this one out myself, but. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if the, Dave is, Dave, is it the, is it this guy right here at the top? I feel like I don't want to like even click on this link. This looks like a, I don't know if I can really try, how to pay zero tax on JP and, you think that one, right? Is that the one? Ugh, makes me nervous because it looks almost like some shyster. Okay, whatever, I will, I'll post it. My name is. Let's copy that one. Control C. If this is bad, this is on Dave. It's your, it's your, it's your, your fault, Dave. <laughs> I hope it's good. There we go. Uh, I posted out there. Now I'm in trouble. Oh boy, I'm in trouble now. Okay. So to Ganesha's point, you know, if it jumps up above 130, you know, what could you do? Well, you could obviously move your stop loss up. It, for me at this point, I can't do anything because I'm still in the options and I don't own the underlier yet. If I do get exercise on January 20th. I'll reevaluate. And again, I'm pretty transparent with you guys, so I'll walk you through it. If I get exercise on my Tesla, exactly what I'm doing with it. But, you know, the premium I collected on Tesla was massive, really incredibly high premiums given all the volatility that was going on. So um, already doing great there. Even if I got exercised at 120 and I sold the 120 call options, I'd be content because I would probably collect a lot of premium at that level uh, as well. Cool. All right, Dave. Thank you for uh, bringing that one up. I will check that one out as well as we progress here. So that's um, that's kind of my take on this one. I know there's going to be maybe some difference of opinions out there. Bottom line is if you don't know what we're talking about with selling covered calls, learn about them. Uh, it's actually a very great strategy in my opinion, especially when markets are sideways or slowly drifting down or, or just slowly going up. Um, you know, especially if you have a long-term position. Questions came in recently about people who got these large positions with former employers in their 401k or just been sitting on positions for years. Look, sell some covered calls. Increase your rate of return. If we look at every month of our consumption of goods and services, right? So your whole life really should be a balance sheet. Here's what I'm earning. Here's what I'm spending. If that number is a negative, then I'm going to go bankrupt eventually. Just a matter of time. So obviously we want to make sure that our income exceeds our expenses. 
if we get to that point, then we got to figure out how can I take whatever is positive cash flow and put that in a situation where I can be generating a rate of return. And if you earn, let's say, 8% per year on your position, fine. But if you sold covered calls against it and got an extra, let's say, 4% per year, now you're at 12% per year. And if you compound that, I could draw spreadsheets for you that show just the incredible price of pre, it's like a hockey stick after a certain amount of years, especially for you young guys, uh, where you could see significant gains. I actually got a new phone yesterday um, and the gentleman that was helping me, 21 year old kid, and he's in all these meme stocks. I had to just shake my head. I'm like, dude, come on, man, you're killing me. He's like, he's like what about what about GameStop? What about AMC? Oh, this guy here says it's the mother of short squeezes. I'm like, the guy's an idiot. The short squeeze already happened, it's done, right? And looking at almost everything he mentioned was a pump and dump scam company. I'm like, listen, kid, you're 21 years old. You want to be rich beyond your wildest dreams and take your check here that you're making at at and take a portion of it, deposit it in an account and options. Go out there and sell covered calls or, you know, buy, in your positions you already have, sell options against that and do that every month and grow and grow and grow and grow. You'll have a higher average rate of return. You'll beat the annual, you should beat the annual um, rate of return of the market, which is 8%. And doing that, Starting at 21, I think everybody here would just be nodding going, man, if I, if I knew right now at 21 what I know now, holy cow, it would be a totally different ballgame. I, I wish someone would have slapped me around. And I thought I was pretty fortunate because at 25, you know, my boss kind of slapped me around and said, listen, you need to start investing. Plan for your future. And if I did this at 21, you know, collecting above average rates of return in the market almost every year, goodness, it would have been an amazing rate of return. So I hope that he listened. He actually said he might be watching this show today. So uh, there we go. Let's see what else we got. Uh, do you use OTA implied volatility gauge? You just pay? Um, Dave, I just do it off a of premium. I do it off a of premium. And, and, and that's not, I, I would say that's probably not the right way. I think the IV gauge is the way to do it. I'm also, I mean, I'm looking at um, that individual security and I know what IV roughly is going to be, right? I know when I should be selling or buying options based off of volatility. So in my head, I'm using it, but I don't put it on the charts. I think anybody starting out should absolutely use the IV gauge. Uh, just to see kind of where things are at, right? It's all about having that routine for you and just step one, step two, step three, step four, and start doing that. Um, then I think you're good. Oh man, Lori started 65. Oh uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, you can't go back and change that because I, I, it would be it would be interesting if I had uh, children because my kid at probably like five or six years old is already gonna be knowing how to trade. I, I just show them the value of money, understand the value of money. I'll give you a dollar today for cleaning your room, but if you wait till Friday, I'll give you $3. What do you want? That kid doesn't say, wait till Friday to make $3. Boot him out of the house at nine months old. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I had to throw it out there. Let's go uh, forward here. If you got stuff, any comments on that section, let me know. But that is kind of my take on you know ETS versus cover calls. I love doing it myself. I, I, I really do enjoy it. So I am biased. I, and I'm not even an expert in options. I just understand them well enough. If um, What do you do with your collected premium? That's a great one. Great. Right? So if we, if FPL, thank you for that question. I should have said that earlier. I don't touch my accounts. So in this, in the 1% account, let's say, I'm just saying hypothetically, start off with $100,000 on January 1st, right? If I make 1% for the month in my option strategy, I make $1,000. So now I put that $1,000 in that account and I have $101,000. So if I make a 1% on that, I'm making, uh, what, $1,010. So I'm compounding. I'm all about compounding. Let it grow, let it grow, let it grow. Unless you have to take that money out, I, I don't need it yet. I will get to that point in the near future where I am, you know, I'll be needing income streams because I, I don't want to work forever. I'm, I'm pretty, I feel like I'm pretty close to the end of my working career anyway, just because I hate working for other people and, and all the bad decisions that those people make. I'd rather make my own decisions. And if I make problems with it, uh, there you go. So I let everything compound. I try to, I would, I would say this for everybody who's trading and trying to grow your accounts, whether you're active trading or long-term I would say have a, a actual physical job that's something you enjoy doing that pays your nut. It pays your rent, your mortgage, your utilities, and that's it. And then with everything else, invest it and trade it and grow and grow and grow and grow. That's, that's how I would approach it. Um, try to live frugally. The more that you can compound, the more I can take and compound today, the far better I'll be in the near future. And I think most people are a little short-sighted and don't think about five years down the road or 10 years down the road. I mean, hell, I think these markets, I gotta be honest, I feel like the markets are starting to turn around. I feel like they're starting to stabilize a little bit, even though there's still this dark cloud looming. 
it doesn't really feel as bad um, right now. And if, if we do turn around, then I will adjust my strategy and hopefully do well. If we start to tank again and we go into this colossal depression that so many people have forecasted, well, you know, I will still implement strategies and hopefully be beating the markets in that market downturn, whatever it may be. But the sad reality is, you know, most people out there, if you look at the S&P 500, oh, this is not the list I wanted. Uh, you know, most people out there lost 20% this year or last year. They got a million bucks. Now, all of a sudden, they're $800,000. So for them to get back up to a million bucks, they're going to have to make 40% rate of return. Uh, sorry. If you had a million and you uh, got to 800, you're down 20%. Now they have to have a 40% rate of return just to get back up to where their account was last year, right? You can't have those kinds of drawdowns. Anyway, I'm ranting. Randall's is minor 35 and 33. They're learning good. You know, technically you passed that 25 mark, but still good. <clears throat> I have a lot of friends who are in their 30s and 40s that still don't even really, can you tell me a little bit about my retirement account? It's yours, dude. This is your future. You should all know about your retirement accounts. All right, let me go through a little bit of economic stuff. What time we got? Holy cow, the time flies. So here is stuff that happened out there today. I'll real quickly just kind of show this one to you. Um, I know there are a couple of you that have been uh, talking or asking a lot about cannabis stocks. You had Tilray report earnings today and they missed badly. They're supposed to lose five cents. They lost six cents. They're down about seven percent or six and a half percent. You know, right back down to those lows. You get this little uh, hook up for about, oops, sorry, you don't see the chart. You have this little hookup for about six days on Tilray and just crashing, gave it all back today. And you look at MJ, the cannabis ETF, you know, that's reflected in there as well. So Tilray is certainly being a big factor in this MJ ETF. You also had a QD Brands AYI report earnings. They were slightly up. They had a pretty big earnings announcement beat, but just look at the volatility. I mean, just a massive candle out there today on Acuity Brands. And that's uh, kind of the main thing that happened out there today. Now for tomorrow, they're really, it's not really that exciting. Even I don't want to look at charts. <laughs> well, you're going to have to look at the charts there. Um, this is what's happening tomorrow. You've got uh, Saratoga Investment, Albertsons Companies, and then really Bed Bath & Beyond, BBBY. I've made the jokes with this one multiple times with you in the past. And I think this one's going under. I mean, everything that they sell in that store, I can get on Amazon cheaper. Everything. And look at that price chart. I mean, this thing had this nice pump back here in 2020. Uh, sorry, 2022. Shot all the way up to 30 bucks. It's at a buck sixty-two. My guess is this will probably do a reverse split, if not just declare bankruptcy here in a very short period of time. They are not looking good at all. Uh, Andy says, "I've come to really like ANKR, not Anchor Pro. Thank goodness, which you talked about in a previous show. I'd like to hear um, what you think of this crypto." Um, you know, I, I think maybe later in the week. So tomorrow I've got Justin Krebs in the program. I think later in the week we can probably do a show more on crypto. I'll keep it a high level, but maybe we can look at a couple different. Um, technologies because anchor it does have some competition so i want to i'd like to bring up more of those uh tomorrow as I mentioned justin krebs is going to be on i have to he actually gave me a cool topic his discussion for tomorrow is six key six keys for those retiring in the next 10 years um so that's gonna be our topic for tomorrow six keys for those retiring in the next 10 years i'm gonna have to listen to that one because i'm pretty much done I, like i say i'm done working for the man i'm not going to retire I, I, I can't not do nothing and just sit around and twiddle my thumbs. I'll have to do something. But uh, as far as working for the man and working for somebody else, uh, that, that ship is just not working anymore. I think most of us get tired at a certain point of working for your employer and figure, you know what? I'll go and travel life, enjoy things a little bit. But uh, Justin Krebs will be my guest for tomorrow. But uh, Andy, I will... Um, I can't do it tomorrow. Maybe we'll do that Wednesday. I'll do a little bit of uh, anchor and kind of a special on maybe some crypto pieces. So if you guys have anything specific in the crypto world you want me to talk about, email's on the screen. It's tradermerlin at gmail.com so you can send them in there. Uh, delay if you've been gone nine. Um, if you, um, yeah, if you have your question, send them at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Let me go to your economic calendar for tomorrow, which is the start of something big. Now, for most of us, it's not going to be that big of a deal. You guys can see down uh, near the, it's kind of in the middle, Jerome Powell will be speaking. It says 6 a.m. U.S. Fed Chair Powell speaks. Again, this is not going to be a monumental speech. He's talking about the role of bank, uh, central banks um, in Sweden. So you never know what he might leak out of his mouth regarding policy. I'm sure he'll get questions from some people 
but that would be a, probably a fairly decent market mover early on. Other than that, you can see you've got tips, IBD economic optimism, as well as final wholesale inventories for the US and the NFIB small business index. So for those of you who are looking at today's market, I guess I can wrap up there because the Russell 2000 was one of your positive ones. Here's our top seven, and then I'll wrap things up. Uh, Dow, down 0.30%. The reason I'm bringing these up is if you look at the futures, you have some shooting stars all over the place. S&P 500, barely down 0.04, but look at that shooting star. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, Russell 2000, hallelujah, shooting star city. Russell was up 0.14%. Gold, another 0.43%. This is a... Um, a uh, spinning top formation, which is a small real body with topping and bottoming tails on the gold futures today, which is after a, a sharp move could be a, viewed as a reversal sign. NASDAQ 100 making the bronze medal at 0.65%. But look at the intraday chart here. This was, it was pretty, pretty awesome. I mean, you start off super bullish, hesitated, and then right around lunchtime, actually a little bit before lunchtime, uh, just started tanking and pretty much gave it all back, even though it was up 0.65%. Crude oil was 1.17% gain on the day, making your silver medalist to $74.63. Technically, though, still not out of the woods. And lastly, there was some happiness in the Bitcoin ecosystem for me. I saw uh, a nice little bullish move today, although when you look at this, let's get rid of this yellow box is dead. Let's just put one on the most recent action. We'll do it to there and call it a day. Um, you know, until we get out of that yellow box right there, I think it's just boring and could care less about uh, what's going on in the crypto world. Just just waiting for something to happen. Wait for the move. Jordan Matthews taught me core and told me I was not too old to start trading. He was right. Yeah, you're never too old. You're never too old. It's just, man, you're, you know, I think part of your lorry is probably sitting there. Why did I wait so long to get into it? I, I From the, the, the conversations I've had with you, I can see the excitement and joy in you when you talk trading. So uh, that, that's the fun of it. Find something that you're passionate about. Find something you enjoy. And I think we're all blessed because there are very few um, professions like trading. I look at trading as very similar to golf, right? It's just you against everybody else. There's, it's not like you have a teammate. Uh, you can work with other people and make trades, but ultimately it's how you deal with the terrain. It's how you deal with the, the sand bunkers and the water shots and your club and the angle and your grip. I mean, it's all just parts of trading as well. And the only person that's going to beat you is you. It's not, I'm not going to screw you up. I'm not going to, uh, you know, you're not going to take, uh, Justin Krebs is not going to come on here tomorrow and, and ruin your world with regards to trading. You have to be the one to make your trades. So ultimately it's up to us to figure out what's right, what's wrong, our risk management and do the best we can so that ultimately we grow our accounts. And to me, um, I was never a good golfer, but I'd much rather be a trader anyway. Just easier to hide in the shadows. Would you trade one of those using futures or stay with an ETF? Uh, when you say trade one of those, what do you mean? You mean one of those, um, uh, that means like sell options on futures? I don't do that personally. I've never traded options on futures. I don't know why, it's something I haven't done. Uh, but you could do that and you could trade options on futures. But I personally would go with the underlier. There's different benefits to different instruments such as SPX um, or going to SPY. And that's a topic for a different discussion. But yeah, I like the underliers, like the big diversified ones. And I mentioned, oh, shooting star. Yes, sorry. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see why not. I mean, you look at this S&P 500 shooting star right now. You know, that, that does speak of bearishness for tomorrow's trading. It does look like you're going to start to see things sell off tomorrow. You know, when you look at SPY, which is not the futures product, you know, you don't have a shooting star. It's, it's a bit different. Let me get rid of these. I don't remember what all these lines were drawn for, but yeah, you don't have the same picture. It actually looks even worse from a bearish perspective because it's just this big red blob sitting on there. There you go. There's nothing like trading. You can wake up, make a week's wage in five minutes. Just nothing like it. Or you could just do nothing. I mean, it's funny because you can wake up whenever you want and it's not your phone's going to ring. You're like, hey, uh, you're not trading today. You better get in here and fire up your computer. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. I'm good. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me for today. I'm going to have Justin Krebs on the program tomorrow and his topic will be six tips for those who are looking to retire in the next 10 years. So if you have someone who is uh, on the older side of things looking to retire, oops, that's not where I went. Uh, looking to retire, I would encourage you to 
Have him watch tomorrow's show. Justin, as you guys know, very knowledgeable. He was a very active trader as well and now does some financial planning. Um, so I think he can bring some good stuff to the table. So we'll talk with Justin tomorrow. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Learned a little something along the way. If you have any comments, questions, put them down below any YouTube video. That's what started this whole discussion for today. So a, a big shout out to Steve for sending that question on the YouTube channel. I appreciate it. You made me a whole show topic for today. That said, I will see all of you tomorrow with Justin Krebs. Take care.